Hello and welcome. Thank you everyone for joining us today for the Market Tech Group's very special Hospital Executive Roundtable discussion. Given the presidential elections took place just two days ago, we should have a very interesting conversation. I'm your moderator today, Robert Enzerink. I'm a partner and senior consultant with the Market Tech Group. Joining me is James Garvin, also a senior consultant with the Market Tech Group. We're very fortunate to welcome four hospital executives who will speak with us about what impact the recent election results are likely to have on hospitals, the healthcare system, and medical technology providers. On the phone joining us today are Max Owens, the CFO of Morristown Hamblin Healthcare System in Morristown, Tennessee, Al White, the Chief Financial Officer of Broadlawns Medical Center in Des Moines, Iowa, and Jerry Durney, Chief Operating Officer of Atlantic Health, Morristown, New Jersey, and Gary Bebo, the Chief Executive Officer of White River Health System in Batesville, Arkansas. Welcome, gentlemen. Now, many of the listeners have submitted questions to the Market Tech Group prior to today's roundtable, and we've incorporated these into the discussion, and we'll bring them up as time allows. Also, as the panelists bring up thought-provoking comments, we encourage the listeners to text questions in the GoToWebinar message box, and we'll address as many of your questions as we can get to uh, during or at the end of today's roundtable. Now, with respect for everyone's time, let's get started. So over the last six to 12 months and longer, the Market Tech Group has heard from numerous hospital executives and administrators that hospital investments and strategic plans have been in a holding pattern until the outcome of the presidential elections are known. Those presidential elections from two days ago, Well, Jerry, uh, let's start with you. We noticed that almost two years ago, you offered a tip of the hat to any enterprise that's even able to get its collective mind around the impending changes of the healthcare reform, let alone map out a new course in response. You also stated that without knowing the details of the plan, strategic planning would be very difficult. Now, how well does this mirror your hospital sentiment and plans prior to the election two days ago? Uh won this election, that cost was coming out of the system. So uh, we, we were planning, and I think as I think it was Al or it was Max who mentioned in our budgets that, you know, we, we really have to bend our cost curve. Uh, you know, margins are going to be key in this, and uh, we have to come up with very creative ways uh, to change our model of care. You know, we need to curb our labor cost. You know, and re- redesign uh, inpatient care. And some of that is going to be through physician alignment. Uh, some of the tenets of the Affordable Care Act, accountable care organizations, standardizing practices and protocols, decreasing utilization of services, so we, we, we're utilizing the right resources at the right time, not duplicating things. Um, and as far as knowing the details, yeah, we know more details than we knew in 2010, but I don't think all the details are on the table either. One of the things this election is going to change is that I think you're going to see, and you're already seeing with CMS, which was already in the works, you know, with uh, the different programs, uh, the value-based purchasing will be, will be expanded, the bundling uh, is already uh, coming about with the new models that are in place, and I think you're going to see an acceleration of that uh, going forward. Um, you know, the, now with the fiscal cliff, you know, Medicare and Medicaid, which were uniform, untouchable, are now going to be on the table. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens either at the end of this year or early next year because something's going to have, have to be done. Uh, very clear, and I think it was the Wall Street Journal, um, maybe it was Fitch, who was saying that uh, the, the uh, the ratings companies are not going to give the Obama administration any fiscal honeymoon at all. They are going to come down and come down fairly hard. I think the only saving grace for the United States with our bond ratings were that uh, in, a, in a comparison mode, we, even though our bonds were or our, our ratings were downgraded, uh, we still looked a lot better than Europe did. But that doesn't mean that that. that uh, our fiscal house is all in order. So I think I think you're gonna see a lot of things happen and happen very quickly. Yeah, interesting. So so Max and Al, what about your perspective as a chief financial officer? Have you had particular initiatives or investments or plans that have been on hold that now that you know the outcome, some of the uncertainty's gone, uh, that now you may be moving ahead with those? 
Yes, uh, Robert, this is Al White from Broadlawns. And for us, uh, we just completed a large construction uh, project from 2008 to 2010 with approximately $30 million in revenue bonds. And as indicated by, you know, Mr. Durney, that we were looking at it saying, I think we did get in at the right time because every indicator is that uh, bond ratings for hospitals will decrease, Moody's, Fitch, et cetera. And so we're looking at it saying, you know, that I think we were, you know, in the right time for that. And so we were indicating that, um, you know, again, for us, the timing was good when we went with it. And now we're looking at it saying, yes, we are having some uh, delays on some of our capital projects. We're still going to be investing in IT as we need to, certainly uh, working on the issues with security, web portals that we have, privacy, and those type things. But yeah, we definitely look at it as an impact. And we're also trying to factor that in with our budget process, which we are just starting. Yeah, yeah. And how about you, Max? Uh, we really haven't changed our plans. Uh, you know, going into it with the election, we were hoping that we'd get a new president. But e even with that, um, we probably didn't plan on a whole lot of things changing, at least in the next year. Um, so far, there's only been probably a third of the actual regulations written on how to implement the first part of uh, the Health Care Reform Act. Um, you know, they, they still don't know everything and how they're going to either tax it, implement it, or whatever. Yeah. So there's still a lot of unknown on the actual regulations. But we spent about $35 million last year in facilities expansion. Um, and you know we're we're moving ahead with physician integration uh, and that type of thing. I just think demand's going to grow while reimbursement's going to either decline or stay stagnant at best. Yeah. And how about you, Gary? Is is your hospital plan to invest more or less in 2013 now? Are, are you speaking? We, speaking. Hello. I'm I'm sorry. We, who, which Gary are you speaking to? Right. Gary. 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 Oh, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Who? I'm sorry. Yeah, Gary Bebo. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry I was a little late getting into the to the um, discussion today. Um, I had a board meeting, just got over. You know, I um, we we had before uh, a lot of the problems that on the ACA started occurring. We already had a major construction program going on, so we're in the final phases of finishing that construction program. But what I've done, uh, awaiting. Um, this election is I put the the significant investment other facility investments on hold until uh, one of two things uh, would occur. One is to see how much money we had at the end of the project that that we're finishing, and second of all to see if we can get any clarity um, in terms of the uncertainties from the health reform bill. I you know I, I I didn't know for sure you know if the ACE if the ACA provisions would change or depend on who was elected or uh, if they even will occur um, and what might affect us. You know, we're a yeah. rural hospital and we have we have in our system a critical access hospital and, you know, we've been very dependent on the stimulus monies and, and yeah. uh, concerned about Medicaid expansion and insurance exchange and penalties that we've all experiencing now. But sure. so, so, so a lot um, of the stuff is just uncertainty that, that kind of made us sit back and not make any further commitments of significance until some of this stuff became clear, right. more clear. So, so now we know uh, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, right, it imposes a 2.3% tax on medical devices starting next year. Uh, mm -hmm. It's projected to collect about $30 billion over the next decade from taxes on medical equipment. And the medical device and diagnostic industry cried out against ACA and some threatened layoffs and offshoring if it's enacted. Uh, there was the, the challenge in the Supreme Court. That's been upheld. Uh, the Obama administration, now in office for another four years, they argue that the claim that the tax will shift jobs overseas are overblown uh, because equipment produced overseas and imported in the U.S. is going to be taxed as well. Um, the Treasury Department, hospitals, and medical technology companies, uh, according to the Treasury Department, 
you guys stand to benefit from the law. They say the 2.3% tax hits the industry, but they argue that the millions of new healthcare customers that are insured as a result of the law are going to increase the demand on you guys. Um, and so in turn, it's going to boost medical device companies' profits because you're going to need more equipment to meet that demand. Uh, but interestingly, most recently, at a number of the orthoped uh, at a number of the quarterly announcements and um, other feedback from the industry, uh, for instance, uh, Zimmer, the uh, the Pure Play Orthopedic Company, at their quarterly announcement earlier this week, they said, you know, maybe the impacts are going to be less than we initially expected. So they're thinking maybe they can work with this. So, uh, Jerry, give us your take. Uh, you know, what's the impact going to be on your bottom line? This is now pretty well set in stone. A lot of the uncertainty that Gary mentioned is is gone. You know, specifically, what are you going to do with regards to your capital purchase and technology investments? Well, we're, we're going to continue to invest in IT, as was previously mentioned. Uh, and uh, that's to, you know, make sure that we meet all the milestones of meaningful use. But more importantly, uh, for us to actually operate efficiently uh, economically, uh, we're going to need to have a IT systems, clinical and otherwise, operating on all cylinders. Uh, I just uh, I just uh, left a meeting this morning with uh, a lot of our cardiologists who we're aligning with, and you know we were having discussions about uh, uh, centralizing. Uh, cardiology imaging and bringing the images to the cardiologist to make the physicians more efficient. Yeah. Making sure that we, uh, our utilization is appropriate. Uh, you know, they, there was a consensus that we were over-utilizing a lot of the cardiology imaging procedures. Yeah. Uh, so, so have, Jerry, we've got you and Al saying that you're intending to invest more in IT. Is that a similar yes, feeling yes, with yes, Gary so, and Max? But, but I'm not going to... Uh, on the other hand, we're being very careful about what other investments we make, particularly bricks and mortar investments. I mean, mm -hmm. we are, we are um, um, uh, making sure as much as possible that we, we're going to private rooms, but that's a lot. A lot of that is redoing nursing units and rethinking the way we do business. We have capacity management uh, in full sway here to uh, make sure that the engines we do have are as efficient as possible, because do remember that there will be more people in the uh, in the healthcare system now with the Affordable Care Act, uh, so we need to make sure we accommodate that. So there is a there's more scrutiny on capital expenditure now than there ever was. So I mean, two things are going on. A lot of the capital, at least from my point of view, is being uh, sucked out of the system, and I don't, maybe that's not the right word to use, but being applied to IT. So there's less capital to begin with, and then we're really not sure of, of what's going to be in the future. We do have a, an accountable care organization. We, we, we're one of the uh, first ones uh, to do that in the, in the pilot project, and uh, you know that's that's a whole new new territory. Um, and making sure that that works is uh, is going to be very important. So we we need to do that. And that's another reason why we need the uh, the, the uh, IT infrastructure. Right. Now, historically, uh, radiology is generally a profitable department in hospitals. How is the outcome of the election going to impact the profitability of the radiology departments? Uh, Gary, do you want to start us out? You know, I think the profitability uh, of the of that i i haven't uh, I haven't really seen any any changes in the reimbursement formulas. Uh, from radiology, other than other than how it's affected through the other programs, I, I think that in all of the major purchases of uh, imaging, um, I, I don't see a, a significant amount of pressure at, at our place anyway for doing going to the the best newest technology right now. I, I've met uh, over the last week with 80 percent of the physicians on our medical staff through individual meetings or in group meetings. And uh, everyone I'm talking to about if we don't uh, get better at revenue cycle and reducing costs, improving efficiencies, we've got a great chance of losing our, our local autonomy. And um, the response to that from the physicians has been unbelievably positive. In fact, I've met with uh, a general surgeon today who 
you know, a month ago would have talked about the Da Vinci robot and, and use of more general surgery. Today it says there's no way we, we can do that and, and, and retain the autonomy we've had in the past. So I, I think in terms of in imaging, um, I think the pressure of getting the, the brightest or the best and the newest uh, technology, uh, I think that there's going to be a softening of, of that demand for a while. Uh, yeah. Just because there's doctors don't, um, they, they don't want to lose local autonomy. And if, if we're good as, a, as a managers, letting them know the crisis that we potentially have in the future, I, I think we're, we're not going to have that element of pressure that we've had in the past. Yeah, good point. So, Al, given what Gary just said, what can manufacturers do to help address these issues? The affordability of technology. One of the things that uh, we've been working with, Robert, is uh, meeting with our vendors and looking at reimbursements and trying to look at each piece as a relative portion of it, saying in the past model, this was a hospital percentage, this is what we were able to pay vendors, and can we work together to say, if the reimbursements are reduced, can we all accept what the lower percentage is? So we've been meeting with vendors on that. We've also been working with them on better response times so we can keep inventory levels a little bit lower and also uh, just getting equipment fixed as soon as possible because sometimes we've had delays in the past which, you know, I think under the new system are not going to be acceptable. So we've been looking at uh, really those three points, I think, and our vendors are, seem very responsive. You know, they certainly read everything and they realize, you know, the position we're in and just the changing uh, health care landscape. And, and Max, how are, in Morristown, Tennessee, uh, you just had a $35 million facility expansion. You obviously had to equip that. Um, how have you been working differently with vendors and, and how do you expect that to change now? Um, we've actually had pretty good luck in, in working with our vendors, getting the best price we can out of them. Uh, for the most part, they are not overly sensitive to our reimbursement and our plight when it comes to what they need to charge. Uh, it's never been on the same you know, playing field. They can charge us whatever, and we have to turn around and try to make a profit on it. I think they are starting to get a little bit more sensitive to that. Uh, yeah. and willing to work with us on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, I even think that some of our DPO agreements are probably going to go by the wayside because um, as an individual hospital, I can go out and get better pricing uh, on a lot of different items than I can just under my group purchasing agreement. Yeah. Interesting. We, we have a question from the, the attendees asking about if your price point for capital is going to change as far as approval levels and, and how you're going to manage that within your hospital groups? Uh, we absolutely have. Um, we've clamped down. You know, Last year, if it was on the budget and approved by our board, we'd spend it. Now, if it's over $25,000, it has to have a separate analysis done and uh, an additional presentation to the board for approval. Yeah, Gary, have you made any changes there? No, we've had for, for quite a long time. Um, <laughs> We only thing the board approves is through the budget process are major uh, capital items like uh, facility changes uh, and anything that would be of, of a large significance in terms of equipment. But even with those, everything over $100,000 for the last five years have required uh, board level uh, review and approval. So we, we've really yeah. gone through that in the past. I, it used to be that when we did the budgets, we tried to put together a detailed listing of of items, I don't. We don't do that anymore. Really, we we really put together a dollar amount each year, how much we're willing to spend on equipment that that uh, we're not aware of at the front of the of the of the year, and yeah. then uh, we just approve through the year up to that level, and then stop. Now, Jerry, you talked about your cardiology department. Are there particular departments that you're going to ask to look at their costs more carefully, or that that you anticipate? That the relative profitability and, and the break-even of those departments is going to be changing now. Uh, absolutely. I mean, if you want to take cardiology, for instance, and I want to mention one thing as we're speaking, some of the other uh, capital investments that are being made is, is there's a lot of position alignment going on. So when you employ positions, you know, you're spending money on asset acquisition and other things like that. 
So that's another uh, drain on the capital pool. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, in this cardiology example, we've now acquired uh, different cardiology groups that some have multiple offices, and there are multiple gamma cameras at these offices. So part of the discussion we have is, you know, we're not going to be, when the hops rates go away because we make them uh, provider-based clinics, uh, and the hops rates will go away, it's just a matter of when. Probably now that the election happened, it'll be sooner than later. Um, we, we will need to, uh, you know, reduce that overhead. We won't need all these cameras, uh, which is, again, brings in the need for uh, really good technology and, and, and positioning our diagnostic testing centers, you know, that are that'll be at, at, you know in our catchment area that'll be convenient for patients to access. So um, yeah, we're looking at that, but we're we're looking at all costs, uh, you know, whether it be uh, food and nutrition, um, housekeeping. Uh, we're we're doing a careful analysis of the profitability of all of our surgical services. Um, uh, we 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 did it. we were in the New Jersey uh, uh, consortium for the. Uh, demonstration project for gain sharing. So we've got uh, some good experience with that. And we're entering model two uh, uh, on, on orthopedic procedures uh, for the bundling. Um, so uh, we're also looking very carefully at, at, at our, you know, our models of care and nursing um, to examine how we can operate more efficiently and actually make changes in a thoughtful way that will maintain our quality and our efficiency. So everything is on the table now. There aren't any safety cows anymore. We have to make sure that the cost curve gets spent as quickly and, 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 and in a sustainable way. Yeah. So Al, similar type of question. You know, which departments do you expect to invest in more and which less as a result of the elections? You know, interestingly, of course, you know, we've talked about IT, and the other ones that we're looking at is a lot more in just some of the uh, diagnostic because we anticipate uh, there will be more need to do some preventive, but, uh, again, the focus is on, you know, again, return on investment like the other panelists have indicated. And we've had in place quite a while, as Gary indicated, levels of approval, and ours is essentially the same as theirs. 25000 and above requires CEO sign-off initial. 100000 does go to the board. And also, we actually, uh, as senior leaders, have capital review committee, and people come in and really provide analysis saying, here's the return on investment, here's the safety issues, here's the patient care issues shortage or you know great need so they really have to try to support these and then something we started doing in the last couple of years is actually having them come back and report how it's actually gone to what they've promised we didn't do that as much before and obviously we're going to ramp that up even more that uh, it's going to be look back at six months and say okay how did um, this go against your plans yeah, so you hold the, the vendors accountable as well for the claims they're making. We sure do. Yeah. Vendors as well as uh, our department heads that are looking at it uh, might be a radiologist as well as the director of imaging, and they'll be coming back in and showing, and we'll be looking at statistics and looking at uh, cost and efficiencies and how many they're doing units. We've been on uh, physician productivity for about the last three years, and as indicated previously, I think we've had a lot of really good buy-in with that. We use MGMA relative value units and measure providers, and we've actually got every department head above on scorecards, looking at the hospital as a whole and then looking at their departments as well. Yeah. Terrific. So uh, another interesting uh, element to consider. Let me, Gary, let me, let me comment a second. I, I think that technology, we're going to use the equipment longer than we've used in the past, too. I believe that, you know, in replacement of equipment, we're going to have longer lives rather than replacing uh, early for the newest technology. I think we're going to be using our older technology longer, too. And I also believe that along the lines of cardiology and, and other surgeries, too, is that we're going to get a lot away from physician preference items. I'm seeing 
in, de, in requiring more of that now than ever in the past under this whole effort of reducing costs and uh, and so I, I think that's going to I think that'll be uh, even more enforced in the future. Yeah, good point. Now uh, I agree with that also. Uh, we would echo that as well. So that's consistent, all four of you. Yeah, terrific. Now, another aspect of ACA is, is potential impacts on your patient mix. Are there specific strategies that you have to optimize the mix for those patients that maybe have private insurance? Uh, Max, what are you doing about that at your location? Uh, actually, we're, we're not doing anything relative to that. Um, we're... You know, my CEO wants to grow market share, uh, whatever it happens to be in our market area. Yeah. Um, we haven't really tried to differentiate between uh, uninsured or underinsured and the insured. Yeah. How about you, Gary? Well, you know, I, I would say in the past what Max has described would be similar to ours, but I think in the future we are um, going to try to work harder to affect our payer mix uh, from one perspective is Medicaid now is in, in our state's paying less in our costs on certain procedures. And uh, I'm meeting with the physicians in those groups right now about uh, whether we should take a quota on how many we'll do a year in that, in that area. And uh, once we reach that quota, start looking at transferring into the university hospital that gets you know public assistance through the state. So well, I, I don't think we've been real aggressive in the past, uh, Robert. I, I, I don't see how we won't. I don't see how we can't be aggressive that in the future. So, I, I think that's a new domain for a lot of us in the nonprofit field, but uh, a necessity one, yeah. you know, a necess necessary one. So, are there specific things that you that maybe a vendor could do to help you with that? Are you going to highlight certain technologies? Are you looking to to bring in new uh, maybe specialties within your hospital? I, well, clearly, I, I right now. Uh, we will not enter into a new service at the hospital that has a negative margin on the front end. You know, right. you know like for example, wound clinics. You know, we have a wound clinic here that that has a negative margin, and and we got bariatric surgery here that's a negative margin. In the uh, really, frankly, I'm looking at getting out of those because we can't continue to provide services that don't uh, that take away from the monies needed to support the short-term acute care function. So it, this is this will be a very painful process as we as we go through that through that kind of thinking in the future. But um, we've we've got to shelter and safeguard the availability of short-term acute care in our community. In order to do that, it may mean that we're going to have to get out of some things that have been good for us to do, and the community is has benefited from it, but just the monies aren't there to, to support its continuance. Yeah, Jerry, how about you? Do you have particular strategies to, to improve the patient mix to, to those more preferable patients? Well, you know, uh, it's really difficult to do that, but I think you've got to look at it from two points of view. You've got to look at it from inpatient volume and also from outpatient volume. Uh, I think you're going to see the pyramid change over time, and at that time frame uh, will, will probably go out you know, well past the Obama uh, last term. Uh, but I think you're going to see commercial insurance shrink, and I think we're going to see a Medicare-like insurance grow and self-pay actually almost go away and for the most part. Uh, so, you know, I agree with what was said by the, by the other panelists that, you know, we too in New Jersey have uh, not a good, good situation with Medicaid at all. It'll be interesting to see what the various states do about Medicaid. Uh, given the Supreme Court uh, uh, so on outpatient procedures, it, you know, it, it, it is it is questionable uh, if you uh, really want to get into the Medicaid business. But I want to make a point that you know, regardless of who the payer is, you know, having a patient in an empty bed is better than having an empty bed. And so, having said that, you may or may not agree with that, but um, if you're going to fill that bed with a patient, you want to make sure that you're as efficient as possible. And then, you know, that's going to include care planning, having a having a, a, a really good capacity management, streamlined discharge, uh, a good admission process so that you don't add any costs when you do bring these patients in. Uh, there's certainly going to be more patients and the, and, and the mix is going to change. And then the other thing I see seeing happening is um, 
as the uh, baby boomer bubble moves through, um, you know, our, I think our, our case mix index is going to change also. Uh, you know, case mix index is driven a, a lot by, mostly by surgery. And uh, you're going to see more chronic conditions get admitted to the hospital, you know, stroke, pulmonary hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, et cetera. And you're going to see that grow. And so we'll have more medical patients rather than surgery patients. So uh, that, I think that's going to come into play also, and that's something we all need to plan for. What's the impact on your bottom line going to be for that? That's uh, negative impact. Yeah. Very, very negative, yeah. Yeah. Surgery is where you usually make all your profits. Yeah. Are there things that, that uh, you can do to help mitigate that downside? Uh, maybe, Al, you can address that? Uh, yes, Robert. I was just thinking, listen to other panelists. We're similar but different. You know, we're seeing that uh, some of the local providers here in Des Moines have been actually capping new Medicaid patients, for example, because, as indicated, the reimbursements are below your costs. And what we've had to look at is if you just get into uh, marginal cost analysis, maybe additional business is better, as noted before, than no business. So we've tried to look at that. We're actually the safety net hospital in the city, and uh, ourselves and University of Iowa hospitals in Iowa City take care a lot of a lot of these patients. We've got a program here called Iowa Care, which is a collaboration between ourselves, University of Iowa, and then some other local providers, and it basically is a Medicaid expansion. So with that, about 50 percent of our care is provided for these patients and we use electronic health records and the health information exchanges to share that data across the state. And I see that being probably replaced at this point by affordable care in January of 2014. So that mm -hmm. will change our landscape. And what we anticipate is a lot of those patients will come here, but others will probably go elsewhere so we've been developing alternative models for our budgets and our operating plans. Yeah, makes sense. Does anybody have another comment on that? Well, when I met, this is Gary again, I, when I made that comment about uh, losing money on Medicaid, I mean, for example, on hip and knee, in, in our state, we get paid $850 a day, and so a hip and knee may stay three or four days, but, you know, the prosthetics cost uh, uh, just short of $5,000. And so there's no way, even the marginal cost, just you can't even pay for the prosthetics, right. let alone the uh, paying for OR time or, or the other supplies or manpower associated with those. So that's the, that's the concern I have on some types of Medicaid reimbursement formulas. You know, the other thing, too, is in, in our state anyway, the Republicans have taken over the House at the state level. And our Republicans, probably as similar to the rest of them, is that they're, they're determined to, to vote against uh, the Medicaid expansion. And, yeah. and so in our state, we could have 250,000 more covered lives, many of which are, we're treating now not getting paid any reimbursement. But uh, I, I, don't, I, I doubt very much that a supermajority can be elected into, into our state right now, uh, or, or a super supermajority will will vote in favor of, uh, of expansion of Medicaid. So, I mean, this is, it's, this is a real dire problem when it comes to reimbursement right now, with the reduction in costs, and then also not have the increase in covered lives that, were, that we anticipated in this health reform bill. Yeah, um, interesting. You, you, I, 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 this is Jerry. I would agree with that. <laughs> also, uh, you know, what, what, what uh, was just said, and, uh, I'd also like to note that even with Medicare, with certain uh, uh, chemotherapy agents and other drugs, you, you uh, don't even meet your cost of the drug on Medicare. Uh, and then in, in New York, I don't know about the, the rest of the areas of the country, uh, New York is uh, going almost completely managed Medicaid, which is just a, which is just a scarier version of general Medicaid. Yeah. So you, 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 the gentleman, you bring up a, a really good point, right? Healthcare in this country used to be about innovation and, and absolute cutting-edge care, and now it seems to be more focusing on a commodity, a return on investment, making sure to meet the bottom line. 
Uh, there are certain technologies that may be just cost prohibitive. Uh, you know, how can suppliers of medical technology help you? They've got their own profit models as well. Um, they need to be able to invest in R&D. But how can they help you be more efficient in, in delivering quality health care in this environment? Uh, well, I feel, Robert, this is Al White. I want to comment on what you just said and the other panelists as well. You know, I think we recognize that there's also going to be the need, as noted there, for alternative cares. You know, we're not going to be able to provide the same level to more people with the same pool of funds. You know, and I think that's uh, we're facing that in this state. Uh, they're talking about $150 million Medicaid shortfall that they're concerned with, and again, trying to add more beneficiaries on the roll and fit that in, it just doesn't work. So again, I think our comment would be that there's going to need to be alternatives to it. I think a Wall Street Journal article put it pretty well, about a third, a third, a third on healthcare inflation, one third being cost, one third being new technology, and the other third being uh, consumption. And so you've really got to look at it and say probably the two-thirds for uh, technology and consumption are where you might be able to have some controls. Yeah. How do you see that, Max? Oh, my personal view is that you know, they're trying to set up rationing without calling it that. <laughs> uh, we all know as providers that we can't provide everything to everybody without money. Um, and so you're going to have shortages. You're going to have, you know, the inability to meet certain demand. Uh, and I think it's going to end up being a real problem at some point. You know, hospitals, there will probably be a few less of them by the end. Uh, they can't survive with all the reductions that are coming down the road as well as price pressures going on. Um, and there's nobody that's willing to step up and say, hey, here's a new source of funding to pay for all this health care. Right. So there's an interesting question from the audience that fits into this. Do you see different models happening that might drive, for instance, uh, higher value for patients that are willing to pay out of pocket? So like premium services that could come out of a patient's pocket. You know, a private room uh, would cost more, but the patient could basically buy into that. Um, this is Max. When I was down in Florida, we actually had doctors who refused Medicare, but uh, for $1,000 a year, I'll be your private physician. Now, I'll spend as much time as you want to with you. Uh, yeah. And that, and they would cap the number of patients that did that to maybe 100. Well, that gave them a million dollars a year, which is way more than they ever got seeing 40 patients a day practicing medicine. Yeah. Are you seeing that, Jerry? Actually, uh, I, I, in my former uh, one of my former lives at Lenox Hill Hospital in, uh, uh, in New York, uh, we actually had several physicians that were uh, practicing that type of medicine. So yes, I think we'll see more of that. But I also want to say that uh, one of the things uh, that the uh, industry could help us with, the vendors, would be for coordination of care. Because although there's a lot of not so good stuff on the horizon, there are some things that we probably should have done as an industry a long time ago. And, and that's really, you know, t breaking down the silos between um, the acute care world, the long-term care world, home care, etc. I mean, yeah. 10 years ago, I never thought that I'd be talking to long-term care administrators and having uh, uh, readmission teams working together, sending in uh, congestive heart failure, nurse practitioners to train their staff and how to care for a heart failure patient when they were discharged from our hospital, uh, making investments in, 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 in just the heart failure clinics, diabetes, education, uh, real, real emphasis now on primary care, uh, and making all that work. So I think that if we can do this right, uh, and, 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 the, uh, and the government doesn't speak out of both sides of its mouth, we could probably could, uh, with the right technology, uh, maybe improve in some cases the care patients are getting. I don't think our health care system, although it's the best in the world, always gets to all the people either. Right. Makes sense. So, uh, you know, thinking about that, the, the coordinated care that you're going, primary acute care to long-term care and more of a holistic approach, um, you know, a lot of the, the audience are, are suppliers and vendors of, of medical technologies. 
one of the things that's been talked about is IT. Are there particular like non-hardware technologies or products that you'd most like to see? Uh, you know, improved cloud-based EMR or, or databases like management software. Uh, Gary, are there things like that that would be particularly helpful for you? Oh, I think that uh, the software that, that can put all this data together that provides us some information that's, that's usable, whether it's on population health or just the ability to share data amongst providers uh, more timely is, is certainly really, really needed. I, I think the big, the big mistake I think we made in this whole IT effort is that we didn't get one product endorsed uh, or supported by the government so that all of us, it seems like uh, all of us have got different software vendors. And, and I think the, the difficulty associated with the exchange is, is going to be obvious from it. So, I, you know, I, I, we've spent a lot of money in IT here. And, and, and the problem that we have is not only what we do here at the house, but how do we exchange that information with the other providers in our community, physicians and, yeah. and others, other providers, <clears throat> to make it all work. And I, this is, I think this is a major problem that, that, uh, that we're all going to have to deal with to really maximize the benefits of, of IT. But make those systems all compatible, right? Yeah, it's going to be a problem. I mean, maybe the rest of the panelists aren't having that issue, but yeah. so Jerry, us, it's, it's a major problem. Jerry, you mentioned IT is a big need at your end where you expect to invest. What what non-hardware products are you looking for? What if you had uh, if you could blue sky this? What would you really like to see succinctly? Oh, you, you need to have certainly a clinical system integrated with your revenue cycle systems that would be ubiquitous. That would be uh, have integrated information flowing from from your 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 clinical care networks on the perimeter of the hospital, meaning primary care offices, subspecialty offices, clinics, home care, into the acute care environment so that the information is ubiquitous to anyone that needs it, especially the physicians. Because this is, good, this is a way in which you will reduce utilization uh, and you will coordinate care among providers. I mean, many, many times tests are repeated within one system because it was not known that a test was already done or the results were not available. Right. Um, so this is something that's going to be essential. And, and the problems we face, is especially when you go to um, acquired physician practices, many of, them are, many of them already have their own EMRs, so you end up with all these legacy EMRs, your, your, your own system, and uh, how do you go about uh, Fixing all of that, so it, it, you know it, there is a lot of operational and logistic and, and capital hurdles you have to go over to make this work right. Yeah. So, Al, you also mentioned IT right near the beginning of our conversation as an, as a high need, uh, valuable investment. What particularly would you like to see? Yes, Robert. Uh, a lot of the same concerns uh, in the state of Iowa. We've got several competing systems. We've got the university hospitals working on a system that we're involved with that uh, shares electronic health records, and that's uh, part with the Department of Human Services. But we've also got a large system in the state, Iowa Health Methodist System, and we belong to their health information network as well and work on things. And what's needed is, as indicated earlier, that medical record, that uh, longitudinal supposedly electronic health record where you can know that uh, what services a patient has been provided, what's been their uh, treatment plan, protocols, et cetera, and that doesn't exist. And again, with these competing systems, that's going to be harder to come by, and we've certainly put a lot into information technology on the HIMSS 7 levels, we reached level 6 about a year, year and a half ago, and anticipate level 7 electronic medical record. And again, it just gets back to being able to have that information to the people that need it at the right time so that uh, duplications can be avoided. Yeah. Now, you're a CFO, and, and Max, you're the other CFO on the panel. Uh, Correct. Is, is the focus on IT because that's where you see the biggest ROI for your investment, or is it something else? No, we're being forced that way due to reimbursement challenges. 
if you don't do something with electronic medical records and meaningful use, you'll have reimbursement reductions. Yeah. So we're being well, well, kind of stimulus. forced down the road. Yeah, and you also lose your stimulus funds if you don't move forward with it, too. So you get, you yeah. get hit both ways. You don't get That's the stimulus all funds, number one, then you get penalized, <laughs> number two. Right. That's all correct, yes. And now these positive so, yeah. and negative. <laughs> we're we're spent, we're probably going to spend twice as much, if not more than twice as much, as we're going to ever receive in stimulus money. And you know, the feeling here is that maybe in two years there won't be any stimulus money left. Yeah, right. So, so it brings a up the, of additional money. <laughs> it brings up another issue that's going to impact your reimbursements, and that's performance-based uh, care and and cap scores. Um, what 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 kind of things would you like to see to help you in that area? Maybe Jerry, start us off real quick. Uh, well, you know the performance the performance based menu is going to do nothing but increase and be expanded. And uh, you know any kind of any kind of technology that can help us improve our court measures or and or uh, the patient experience is something that we need to look at. I mean we we must. Uh, doing a little experiment now in one of our nursing units, for instance, where we're putting in this high-value acoustical tile and sound baffles. We're redoing the nursing unit, and uh, and, and we're, we measured the ambient sound before and we're, you know, when it was occupied, and, and, and we're going to do that again after we uh, set it back up. But the whole point here is just to, you know, to tone down the noise in the, in the unit. And this is, you know, uh, one of the questions on, on the Medicare uh, patient experience survey. Right. On, on quietness. Um, so, and, you know, it, it, there's also behavioral things that need to be happening and stuff like that. So tech, any technology like that that's going to uh, help us improve our quality, uh, help us improve the patient experience is something that, that would be of tremendous interest, I think. But it has to be real and uh, demonstrable and, you know, be, be able to be measured. Yeah, so what's the role of consultants and, and service outsourcing to address this patient care and uh, the patient experience? Gary? I think, you know, consultants, one thing they benefit from is they get a lot of experience in different parts of the country that that we may not have ourselves. So, you know, that what I, what I use consultants for is, is not only get that more national perspective, but also to convince others in my leadership team that, that, um, that by them saying it, it's true. Whereas if I just said it by myself without it, so, you know, sometimes <laughs> consultants are worth worth that for to motivate a medical staff or motivate a board member to do things that you know that that uh, I can't accomplish by myself. So, so on a uh, scale of, of one to five, say where one is it's a waste of money to five consultants provide absolutely terrific value. Uh, what's I your perspective of consultants, Gary? I think it depends on the on the issue. You know, I I think uh, on, on, on things uh, such as uh, medical staff alignment and uh, in in the hospital initiatives. I, I think you know you, you, assistance. You know, in what type of alignment makes sense. I think you're in a four or five range. Yeah. You know? How about you, Jerry? I think it just depends on the issue. Yeah, Jerry. How about you? Um, Consultants, one to five. I I would agree a four to five range, but what the qualification is is that one must manage their consultants, and I've seen too many times where consultants have come in, done the analysis, done the recommendations, but it never the rubber never meets the road. So there's an accountability on you and your team to take what was done and run with it afterwards. Uh, as, yeah. So that, that's key. Yeah. How about you, Max? One to five on the value of consultants. It, it depends on whether they give you a plan that's really actionable or not. Um, you know, they can come in and tell you the pie in the sky, but if you can't implement it or it won't be implemented, you've wasted your money. Yeah, you guys have been listening to too many political debates. You're, everything's qualitative, right? Um, how how has, about you? It has to be. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We've all been conditioned over the last few months. So, Al, how about you, the value of consultants from one to five? Yeah, we've had kind of the same thing, and we've had uh, some of the department directors say to the consultants, less BS. Yeah. And we've told them that they need to give us something that meets our needs. We don't care what their product is exactly. How does it apply to us? Do you have something that we can actually take and use and measure care and look at uh, just being more efficient with it? Show us how it's going to do that rather than just what it does. Mm -hmm. 
And, and I'll, this is Max again. I'll, I'll be a little bit fairer. We've had one consulting group in that we've gotten three dollars back for every one dollar out. Got it. Yeah. So we're starting to get near the end of our time. I'd like to ask you each uh, one last question. And thinking about, you know, advice that you could give to an audience, if you had all the suppliers and vendors available in a large auditorium, and you as a hospital executive, with the challenges you're facing, uh, the election results may or may not be what you were hoping for, um, you now have a better vision of what the uh, healthcare market and the healthcare financial situation is going to look like for the next four years or more. Um, you know, very briefly, uh, maybe start with you, Max. You know, give me an example or give the, the audience an example of a vendor maybe relationship that's really exceeding expectations to support your hospital and, and in the form of if that's advice that you'd like to have them all take as an example and all implement and that's what you want delivered to you. Yeah, I, I'll give you a real life example. I, I've actually had um, a vendor come in and talk to both me uh, and the physician that was involved uh, on how to how to better document in medical records and uh, gain approval for the use of his device. And actually came in and did a lot of education and training one on one with the physician and his staff, uh, and really tried to understand uh, our position of your. your item costs nine thousand dollars and I get four thousand dollars in reimbursement this isn't going to work right uh, and we actually stopped doing those procedures uh, and this was a hospital several years ago now but the vendor actually came to the hospital was very concerned brought their reimbursement person in worked with the doctor and and really did a lot uh, to try and improve our financial position while still being able to use his products yeah. Um, you know, to me, they really need to understand the hospital setting. Um, you know, I know that they have costs and, and staff and they have to make a profit, but if there's not hospitals for them to sell these items to, they're going to go out of business as well. Right. So, Jerry, how about you? Do you have uh, an example uh, that would serve as advice for the audience on what's really valuable to you? What was memorable that a vendor really exceed your expectations to support the business of healthcare at your hospital? Well, at one of the organizations I was at, we uh, outsourced our food and nutrition and uh, the vendor we chose uh, actually reduced my cost, met all the metrics, uh, improved the service, improved the atmosphere, improved customer satisfaction dramatically, um, patient satisfaction actually. And, uh, you know, this was all written into the agreement. And uh, I have to say that uh, they exceeded my expectations. And they did that because of the team they put in place. Uh, and, and what was important is is that the staff, um, our, our physicians or our patients, would not know that this service is now being managed by folks that really weren't our employees. They became part of our team. Uh, and uh, they considered themselves part of our team. So I think you really need someone that's going to be invested uh, not only in the, in the service they provide, but you know, also really truly partnering with you. That word partner is thrown around a lot. And right. In this particular case I, re I refer to, it, it really had a meaning and it, and it was beneficial for both. Was any of that contract at risk where you had some profit sharing? Absolutely. Yeah, it sounded like it. Terrific. So, Gary, how about you? Uh, an example of a vendor that really exceeded expectations that would set a benchmark for, for all the vendors that, that you could talk to. You know, ever since you started that conversation, I was rolling through that in my mind, too, Robert. And I can't, you have one. I can't give you many. I can't give you many examples. I, here's, I can't give you any, but frankly, if I was a manufacturer today, I would be looking at what are the top things that are keeping CEOs, or in this case CFOs, up at night. Yeah. And, uh, and start developing a plan that would uh, address address those when meeting with with us, and um, and that's where I think uh, I think that's where the manufacturer are missing it right now. They're so they're so uh, into themselves and their product. They're missing what are the the motivational uh, issues for hospital executives. And you can get published data on a regular basis of what's what are the most pressing issues that we in healthcare management is dealing with, and if manufacturers would come rather than having the 
the unilateral focal point on their product, but looking at the overall problems at the hospital management, they'd have a lot better success rate and put in getting their objective done as well. And, and I, unfortunately, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not seeing that today um, yeah. in, in manufacturers when they're interacting with us. And I suspect everybody in the panel would agree with that. They'd like to see as much of that as possible. So, Al, you have the last opportunity to uh, give us an example of a, a real benchmark, a, a vendor that really uh, set the standard, exceeded your expectations that you would like to see all of your suppliers do to, to help you deliver health care more efficiently and, and cost effectively. Yeah, our examples would really be, as I listened to it, I heard two that we've got going on. We have one with food and nutrition where we have shared cost and risk, and they share in the customer satisfaction surveys with Press Ganey, and as that goes up and down, so does uh, some of their incentive pay. And we've also got same situation with them on uh, margins, operating margins and looking at uh, staffing efficiencies and had them come in and work with us on staffing models. And looking at, uh, particularly with our new construction, we had done 30 million finished uh, a couple of years ago with a new emergency department and other areas. And as we looked at it, uh, we said we've got to you know, try to be more efficient. And so they've worked with us on that. And that would be probably my first example. And then we've got one similar to one of the others where we have a coding company that came in and has come back in several times with experts reviewing and helping both with uh, clinical care process as well as background coding. So, you know, again, I think those are the type of things that uh, providers are going to be looking for from their vendors. Yeah. Terrific. And I'll give I'll give you one good example. You know, we've used a management company to operate our pharmacies, uh, and they've gone at risk with us um, with certain you know here's minimum and here's you know where we profit share between the two of us, and we've actually kept our drug costs uh, reasonably low compared to other areas where drug costs have been going up considerably. Wonderful. So we're getting near the end of our time and. Uh, We've obviously heard a lot of very interesting things. Just looking at my notes here, I think a, 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 a consistent theme throughout the discussion is that you'd like to see closer vendor relationships where the vendor is, is really focused on your needs. Given the healthcare environment that, that we're seeing as a result of the election, you need them to, to understand better your financial situation when you're making investment decisions and purchasing decisions. Uh, there's an increased focus on patient experience because of the HCAP scores impact on your reimbursement. Uh, coordinated care is becoming more important. Uh, the, 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 the complete uh, spectrum from acute care to long-term care is falling in your laps. Uh, case mix index is changing. Uh, more medical versus surgical cases, which impacts your, your bottom line significantly. Um, you're all focusing on, on improving efficiency of nursing and other services uh, because that impacts your bottom line. Again, your decreasing inventory levels was brought, brought up early on. Uh, you'd like vendors to help with uh, more rapid repair to maintain uptime because you're anticipating a greater utilization of your equipment. Uh, in addition, you're going to be investing less in, in highest end technology just for technology's sake, um, as well as uh, retaining equipment. You're going to have longer life cycles for the equipment you do purchase. Um, capital acquisitions, you're, you anticipate closer alignment between physician groups and hospitals uh, for making better in investment decisions and really looking at the, the overall cost of ownership uh, and ROI for the, the capital investments. And you're going to be dropping money, losing specialties potentially, so that you can focus on the safety net needs of your community. And then I think one big area where there's investment with positive ROI potential is broadly compatible IT systems that help you be more efficient overall. So on behalf of the Market Tech Group, we'd like to thank everyone for their participation. Um, thanks to our attendees from across the country, and uh, we particularly wish those of you from New Jersey, New York, the area, rapid recovery uh, for you and your coworkers and friends and family. Particularly, we'd like to thank our panelists, Max Owens, Al White, Jerry Durney, and Gary Bebo. Um, we really appreciate your time, and after the close, we'd like you to take a moment to complete a survey. Uh, remember, the Market Tech Group is a medical technology marketing research firm, so we really do appreciate and, and thrive on that kind of feedback. Uh, good day to everyone, 
and we appreciate your time and attendance. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.